So uh, I'll take this opportunity, first of all, uh, welcome everyone and thank you for your participation. In particular, I thank you, uh, Dr. Madama Novak, for agreeing to be our speaker tonight. So let me give you a brief introduction uh, to uh, Dama Novak's background. But he is the currently the Vice President of Engineering at the OK Wireless, where she developed the high performance of radio frequency over fiber technologies for commercial and defense wireless applications. She is also the honorary uh, professional uh, fellow in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Novak has over 30 years of experience uh, working in the optical and wireless communication field. She has contributed several year, uh, book chapters uh, on the design of fiber wireless communication systems and has more than 300 uh, publications in these areas, including several book chapters and patents. Dr. Novak has extensive uh, technical leadership and project management experience in both the industry and academic sector. Prior to co-founding the Pirate in 2004, she spent 12 years as a professor and chair of telecommunications in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Melbourne, Australia. And uh, from June 2001 to December 2003, uh, she was a technical section lead at the Venture Tactic uh, Dorsal Network Institute, uh, Incorporated. And later at the Corvus uh, Corporation, uh, where she led the cross disciplinary R&D team, developing hardware for the long haul transmission systems. In 2007, Dr. Novak was elected to the grade of RGBE Fellow for her contributions to enabling technology for the implementation of fiber radio systems. In 2018, she received the RGBE Photonics Society Engineering Achievement Award. Dr. Novak is the current chair of the RGBE TAD Technical Achievement Board Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. And she was a member of the RGBE Board of Directors, as being the director of RGBE Division X for 2021 to 22. Dr. Novak received her Bachelor of Electrical Engineering with first class honors and Doctor of Philosophy from the University of Queensland in 1987 and 1992, respectively. So now, without further ado, may I invite Dr. Novak to the floor? Thank you. Thank you very much, Lance. Thank you, thank you Professor Lance, for uh, the opening remarks and uh, the introduction of the speaker. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Dalma to uh, start the session? And good afternoon and good evening to all participants. Today's topic is very interesting, and the speaker is too. May I request Dalma, Dr. Dalma to kindly start the session? Over to Dr. Dalma. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to uh give this region 10 talk i'm delighted to be here as a former I, uh, region 10 member it's nice to be um back uh back home so let me just share my slide make sure that everyone can see that before i start Can everyone see my slides? Because I think it seems to be still loading. Everyone can see? Okay. Sorry, I'm having an issue with um Sanjay, could you check that um, Dr. Nowak has the presenter's status? Yep. Okay. I think everyone can see that now. Like yes. <laughs> Let's continue. So, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, 
radio over fiber technologies for 5G and beyond. Uh, this is an area that I've been working in for probably longer than I, they were, I care to remember. So I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to cover today uh, was to, let me just go to presentation mode was to um, just sort of talk about why fiber is being used to transport radio signals and then give a little bit of an overview of current 5G and next generation 5G networks and then talk about the optical transport technology for enabling the transport of these types of signals over optical fiber. And what I also wanted to cover was emerging 5G networks, particularly 5G advanced and 6G, which are working at much higher frequencies. And that gives a very interesting opportunity for fiber optic links for transporting such high frequency signals. So in terms of the use of optical fiber, I mean, it has really been around uh, for a long time in terms of several, um, probably close to uh, 50 years, essentially when optical fiber was first introduced. And when we look at what wireless frequencies actually cover, it's everything from uh, in the several hundred uh, megahertz range and all the way up into the, um, you know, terahertz frequency range. And within that very large uh, frequency spectrum allocation, there are a number of different bands covering all sorts of different services. And where the use of optical fiber first started was actually very much from the defense, looking at microwave links. And then once cellular networks and um, telephony was established, and it really focused on the frequencies for uh, wireless networking. So in addition to the wide range of frequencies that are supported by um, all these different radio networks, there are also things that we need to consider in terms of the way that the radio signal itself propagates through free space. And this is a, uh, a well-known chart for those of us who work in this field. We know very well how um, attenuation in the atmosphere caused by oxygen or other um, water molecules really impact the propagation of that signal. And that has a uh, very big impact on how the network is actually designed um, in order to have to deal with that. So fundamentally, as soon as uh, for, for commercial telecoms, there was an interest in using optical fiber to also transport uh, analog RF signals, not just digital signals. And so um, the whole concept here was really, first of all, the fact that it's optical fiber had a very low attenuation. But the other key aspect um, that many people don't really recognize is that optical fiber also means that uh, the attenuation is not proportional to the frequency of the RF signal, which is in contrast to conventional electronic uh, uh, distribution schemes like uh, coax, for example. So when you look at optical fiber, typically the, the attenuation is around half a dB per kilometer, and it's also very lightweight. But compared to coax, coax, the frequency, the attenuation, depends very much on the actual frequency. And so even just at two gigahertz, the attenuation of coax uh, over uh, one kilometer will be uh, up 360 uh, decibels, and also it weighs a lot more. Optical fiber also has a number of other advantages. It has um, immunity to uh, electromagnetic interference, which really means that you can put a lot of uh, fibers together, each carrying different signals, and they won't interfere with one another. And you also have design flexibility. You can have multiple cables, uh, multiple fiber strands within a cable, which increases your bandwidth dramatically and also uh, allows you to use wavelength division multiplexing. And so, in fact, the very early implementation of fiber radio systems, once cordless te telephony was invented, uh, these systems were started to appear about three decades ago. They were based on analog optical links. And now in that time frame, there's been an evolution to digital fiber optic links for transporting the radio signals. And when you look at the different applications now for where fiber is being inserted, it's all different types of applications, anything from uh, coverage indoors, uh, outdoor systems for uh, back hall and front hall for mobile networks, broadband fixed and mobile wireless uh, access, and also for delivery of satellite signals, which has been a big application space um, for uh, types of systems. So generically now, when you look at 
the use of optical fiber links uh, and for uh, transporting radio signals, ultimately what you have is this type of integrated optical wireless network. And this is an example of a heterogeneous network. And in fact, when fiber was first invented, there was this thinking that it would be a competitor to wireless. And what people have come to realize is that they're actually complementary technologies. Because fiber has advantages, not just from the uh, propagation characteristics of it as a transmission medium, but it also has a lot of advantages in terms of the optical networking aspect. You can get very large bandwidths. You have a lot of management aspects that you can do very successfully in the optical domain. And so when you look at the these two networks working uh, to, together, what wireless offers you and what a wide network cannot is the ability to be mobile, to be tetherless. So we always need mobile networks, and then we have our wide network, which will be optical fiber in order to really combine the synergies and the advantages of both of those types of networks. And this is really a way in which current and next generation networks can be deployed successfully, but can also be managed together as well. And so when these networks are designed, you have to consider all the different aspects of implementing the wireless network, but also your uh, optical fiber one as well. So I wanted to just give a little bit of perspective and introduce 5G networks and where, they're, where they are going. It's interesting when you look at the evolution of mobile network standards from uh, about four decades ago, very early on, it was just all about voice. Uh, and the, the bit rates that we were dealing with was literally one to two kilobits per second. Once we got to uh, digital data being put onto that, uh, that radio network, and these types of standards were like GSM and CDMA, then the bandwidth was able to increase, but still only in the kilobits per second, tens of kilobits. And then as these uh, Gs have evolved, you can see that over the, the decades, we've gone from 2G now up to 5G. And really what's happening is we're adding more services, so not just voice anymore, now we have data and video, and video is a really big uh, part of the reason why we have this data escalation uh, issue that all the telecom operators have to deal with. And the bandwidth started to go up into the megabits per second. Uh, a couple of years ago, we started to go up into 100 megabits per second with um, long-term evolution and WiMAX 4G. And now with 5G that has been in place for at least the last five years, now we're looking at in excess of megabits and even up into the gigabits per second to the user. So 5G is all about enabling different types of services. Um, it's making, uh, allowing us to have increased connection density, increasing capacity, increasing reliability and reduce latency. This is a very important application. Ultra reliable, low latency is where they talk about uh, massive machine connected uh, objects. Increased availability, but also reducing the network usage as well. So alongside the, um, uh, the introduction of 5G networks has been the evolution of the interface, the air interface and the standards. And so this is just a perspective from Qualcomm, who are a very big, um, who have been making a, a lot of the different technologies for 5G networks. So 5G is about diverse services, as I said, the um, uh, ultra low latency, and you've got massive interconnection of objects, and also enhanced mobile broadband, really improving the quality of the signal and the data rate to the user. But the other interesting aspect of 5G is that it, it allows you to install a network covering a very diverse part of the electromagnetic spectrum, everything from below one gigahertz up into the millimeter wave frequency range above 24 gigahertz. And I'll show some examples um, in a minute that show where the different frequency bands have been deployed around the world. Uh, the other aspect of 5G is that you have it being deployed in a number of different uh, deployment scenarios. So a lot of 5G networks are being used, set up by enterprise networks. 
you have um, different types of um, wireless personal area networks, all different types of deployment scenarios. And here on below is sort of the timeline to show the evolution of those standards and how they've evolved. From um, uh, I go to Mobile World Congress every year, and it's been interesting to see the evolution um, of the technologies that are being introduced there. About six years ago, it was all looking at point to point links in the millimeter wave frequency range. There was sort of the hero experiments. And now it's evolved very much into the application space and showing, for example, a smart manufacturing facility and interconnection of things. And so along with the, the research side, you have the deployment and you have the ongoing evolution of the standards as well. So today, most of the 5G spectrum uh, and the usage around the world has really focused on that mid-band frequency spectrum. And, and fundamentally, that's because of the, the, the challenge in implementing these millimeter wave technologies that can support the higher frequency band. So currently, uh, less than 10% of uh, 5G deployments are in the millimeter wave frequency band. But I think as time evolves and the technologies improve, we'll start to see uh, more launches in the higher frequency. When 5G was first being deployed, it was all about non-standalone system. And that just means that it was the 5G network was really built on existing 4G. And so it was built to be compatible with that in order to enable um, a, a faster deployment. But now standalone systems are being um, very much established with their own potential and their own ability to support higher and higher data rates. In the beginning, China and Korea really the, were really leading the way in terms of the usage of 5G and the deployments. Uh, last year, the US actually had the most number of deployments per city. And around the world, more than 92 countries have commercial 5G networks. And there are more and more countries that are deploying these. And increasingly, for example, uh, in Africa, there are um, uh, emerging markets as well. And so down below shows you just some uh, of the different countries around the world over the last couple of years and where they've done their installation of 5G, whether it's in the low band, the mid band, or in the higher frequency band. So the next thing beyond 5G is 5G advanced. And people see this as a precursor to 6G. Some of you may already hear about 6G, but really 6G is still at this point uh, as a, a research concept. But 5G advanced is something that's been working on right now in terms of a standard and the concept will be um, potentially deployed in a couple of years time. This is focusing on the up, uh, uplink technology in these types of networks with the um, ability to improve speed, coverage, mobility and power efficiency. And where people see this going is that it's about uh, establishing what might be the requirements for a potential 6G network which ultimately within about five years could lead to a deployment. So here are some examples of where and what countries millimeter wave frequencies have been deployed with respect to 5G networks. And you can see that uh, when you look at uh, Asia, for example, and also within countries within Europe, they've largely focused on the 26 to 28 gigahertz frequency range. The US is also considering frequencies up around 38 to 40 gigahertz. The US has really been doing a lot of the, using a lot of millimeter wave spectrum for 5G use for fixed uh, wave, uh, sorry, fixed wireless access, predominantly applications, point to point links. Um, and the main application, as I said, is uh, fixed wireless access for private networks rural distribution as well, and also for implementing uh, backhaul. So as of a couple of years ago, uh, most of the, uh, only a few of the trials of 5G were using that millimeter wave frequency range. Uh, most recently, Verizon has been um, using the millimeter wave spectrum, for example, to demonstrate uh, some of their technologies. You can see one of the things that uh, when these demonstrations at millimeter wave frequencies were first introduced, it was very much about trying to get the most amount of data. And for that reason, it was a point to point link and it was not really a user being able to have 
that capability over 10 gigabits per second from their device at millimeter wave frequencies. That is now evolving, um, but it will still take some time before we can get that amount of data um, in our handset, for example. So when you look at now the transition to future 6G and where that's going to be, you can see that the blue here, this is from Ericsson. Ericsson are already starting to look at how these scenarios uh, might be introduced. So the current frequency uh, spectrum range, you're looking at um, 1 to 3 gigahertz. You're looking in the 30 to um, 80 gigahertz frequency range. And now uh, the sub terahertz frequency range is a potential for 6G, but also possibly around 10G as well. And so there's a lot of research that's going on right now. It's very interesting research um, and exciting in the sub terahertz range. The challenge really is going to be about, um, I showed that graph before, the propagation and how the signal propagates at such high frequencies. It's going to really limit the uh, coverage area. So that means you're going to have to replicate a lot of the hardware, which is uh, obviously going to be expensive. Going to such a high frequency does allow you to get very, very high data rates, which is really key here. Um, but at the same time, right now, the radio frequency components that can support these types of systems is very limited. And obviously, there's a lot of research that's going uh, on with that. So when you look at 5G and 6G and how they're sort of evolving together, um, people like to say 6G is 5G on steroids. So, you know, the, the three sort of main application spaces that I mentioned for 5G are these ultra-reliable, low-latency networks for different applications that require it, enhanced mobile broadband, and also this massive machine-type uh, communications. So now, going to 6G, when you look at these MMTC, this massive interconnection of, of objects, with 5G, they're looking at over 1 million connected low data rate objects within one kilometer. Now in 6G, you're looking at 10 million, for example. And similarly with the uh, ultra reliable low latency, this is now going to even more um, high level of security and safety for those applications and even lower latency as well, less than one millisecond. And similarly on the enhanced mobile broadband, this is about now going to even higher data rates. So not just 10 gigabits per second to the user, but now potentially over 100 gigabits per second. And so you can see the capacity is in 6G would greatly expand. The coverage would greatly expand as well. So now it would be not just land coverage, but also sea and potentially space. And also continuing to reduce the power consumption, which is something that 5G has focused on, coming up with new use cases. So this is some very interesting um, applications for that. And this is coming from NTT and their perspective of when commercial 6G services uh, might be introduced. So that's just a little bit of an overview of 5G and 6G. And now what I wanted to kind of talk about was the optical side and where optical may play a role uh, in these types of systems, particularly in, in 6G, where I think analog uh, RF over fiber links can have uh, an opportunity to play a role. So as I said before, in, there was this evolution uh, once cellular networks came in with 4G to go from the analog to the digital domain. And when you look at a conventional 4G mobile network, this is where you currently have fiber optic links being implemented. They're digital based. So in this type of system, there is a distinction between the fiber that goes from your um, metropolitan backbone network, from your mobile switching center to the baseband unit, which is located uh, relatively close to the actual antenna. This connection here, the backhaul part, is an optical link based on ethernet packets. When you now go from your baseband unit, which is where you have your um, management of the, the data itself and the um, conversion into the frequency domain, that signal that goes to the remote radio head, which here is purely uh, analog, is the um, over fiber, but it's actually a 
digitized point to point fiber optic link between the remote radio head and the baseband unit. And currently there are two main standards that cover that digitization process and how that's done. It's CIPRI, which is a term you may have heard, the common public radio interface, and OBSI, which is the open base station architecture uh, initiative. And if you go into a little bit more detail in terms of what happens within the baseband unit and the remote radio head, you can see in the baseband unit, you have basically where your um, control is happening or in the digital domain. It's the base station control and your clock and your management. And then you have this transition from there to your remote radio head. And this part here is where you have the conversion from the digital to the IF domain, IF being the intermediate frequency, and it's in the digital domain, this digitization. Once it gets to the remote radio head, that signal is received. It's still a digital signal, and then it gets converted into an, a lower intermediate frequency that gets up converted to the right radio frequency for the particular radio system. It has to, always has to be amplified and then it gets directed to the antenna itself. So these sort of the sort of the different building blocks. There is uh, fiber is currently used extensively for implementing um, the backhaul for 5G deployments. And when you look at the graph and how this is evolving, you can see the fiber is being increasingly used. There are still some other technologies that are used for that backhaul part. Um, you have free space optics are used a little bit, but also millimeter wave point to point links operating in the 60 to 80 gigahertz range are also used uh, to some extent as well in this in the backhaul itself. But the actual front hall is always a digitized intermediate frequency link. And if you go down even further into all the different piece parts of the hardware that is required there. What I want to sort of highlight here is what some of the challenges is in implementing a digitized CIPRI based front hall for a 5G plus or a 6G network. So starting here from the right, you have your antenna. If we go in this direction, if the antenna is receiving the signal, it gets amplified. And the data on that signal always has an I and a Q um, element. So you see these two signal paths here, they get filtered. You have local oscillators that do the down conversion from the RF down to the intermediate frequency do domain. And then the intermediate frequency, which is typically in the megahertz range, is digitized using an analog to digital converter. You then have that signal then being split and going down into the um, baseband and you have some various electronics happening. And in the upstream, you have the uh, equivalent process here. What's interesting is when you look at what resulting bandwidth of the signal of that CIPRI digitized signal actually results going through this digitization process. So the example I show here is a once you get into the intermediate frequency domain, your frequency is around 100 megahertz. And we're looking at a radio that has, uh, or an antenna, that was a system with uh, five channels, each at 20 megahertz. You have uh, an antenna that has uh, eight layers of MIMO on it. The sampling rate of that ADC is 30 mega samples per second. You have the number of quantization bits in this example is 30. Uh, you've got five channels, eight antennas, and then you have a little bit of an overhead due to that um, uh, digitization process as well. And so when you look at the bandwidth that results of that optical link, you have all these factors multiplied together. In this example, you can see that you have a, a bandwidth, a digital bandwidth of that link of being 40 gigabits per second. So you've suddenly gone from only having a frequency in the megahertz range to now suddenly being in the gigabits per second range. And this is a real issue. This is called a, a bandwidth escalation problem that results from this digitization process. And if we're going to go to now 6G networks that are looking at even higher and higher data rates and higher frequencies, this is going to potentially be a real uh, bottleneck. So currently in the existing CIPRI 
uh, standard, there are uh, have developing some other alternatives called enhanced CIPRI, where what they've been trying to do is work with the existing technology to try to split some of the functional um, parts of the baseband unit and the remote radio head. Um, but there are some trade offs between the latency that you can achieve and the throughput and how you can still make this relatively centralized. So this is going to be a real challenge. And one of the key advantages for having everything still in the analog domain and not doing the digitization is that you don't have that bandwidth issue. If you can support the uh, finding the right optical components to support everything being still at the RF frequency level, then in terms of the hardware, you have the, the simplest configuration that you possibly could. The real challenge though for analog is that in the current system, because it's analog, it's not compatible with time division multiplexing. Um, however, it's still making sure that you preserve your uh, waveform, which is relevant to certain standard requirements. And so the other two um, options that I show here is the conventional one here for front hall, which is a digitized IF over fiber. It has very standard uh, interfaces, but it uses a lot of energy because of that digitization. It has a lot of hardware as well. There is an intermediate approach that could be done, which is doing the digitization, not at IF, but at RF. Um, you can reduce the bandwidth. However, you're really um, now putting a lot of requirements on your analog to digital and digital to analog converted technology. And at this point in time, finding these components that can support very high sampling rates and very large number of bits, um, e knobs is very, very challenging. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what sort of performance you can get in analog RF over fiber lengths, because I think these will have a real opportunity for future 6G networks that are looking in the millimeter wave frequency range. So if you look at you know, the going from the um, electrical down to the optical domain in you when you want to take an RF signal and put it over optical fiber, the first thing you need to do is you need to go from the RF to the optical domain. And so typically the way this is done is to directly modulate a laser or I use a laser in conjunction with an optical modulator. And so the particular characteristics of that E to O converting device are things that will limit the performance of that analog link. And fundamentally a very important one is what sort of conversion efficiency you can get going from the electrical to the optical domain, which impacts the link gain. So without any type of amplification, typically you'll get a about 20 to 30 dB of in, intrinsic loss in an analog optical link, which clearly is something that needs to be compensated. But in addition to that, you've also got the uh, other aspects that are that um, uh, performance limitations of those devices. Inherently, they tend to be nonlinear. They introduce uh, relative intensity noise and they have nonlinear aspects as well into modulation distortion products too. As that signal propagates over optical fiber, you've also got the characteristics of the fiber playing a role here. And here the dispersion can play a key role, particularly at higher frequencies. In addition to that, at the other end, you've got the characteristics of the photodetecting element that does the conversion from the optical to the electrical domain. It can also be nonlinear. It introduces some shot noise, thermal noise as well. So all of these things play a role in determining the performance of that link. Now I wanted to mention dispersion in particular because there's been a lot of research done on trying to mitigate dispersion in RF over fiber systems, particularly at high frequencies. And why this is, is a problem is when you look at the very simplest implementation of an analog link, it's called, uh, it's done through intensity modulation direct detection. And what happens here when you modulate an optical carrier, this type of modulation scheme gives you this sort of spectrum. It's an optical carrier with two sidebands. And so these two sidebands have data modulated onto them, but they're spaced apart from the carrier at the actual RF frequency itself. As this optical spectrum propagates over the fiber, dispersion causes these two sidebands 
to change phase relative to one another. And the phase shift is proportional to this particular equation. And what you see here is that the phase shift depends on the actual RF frequency. The higher the RF frequency, the more the phase shift. And what happens is when you get these two signals now acquiring a phase shift relative to each other at the photodetector, ultimately they can actually cancel the power once they're detected by that photo uh, photo detector itself. And so fundamentally what you can see, if you were to measure the power uh, along the end of a fiber optic link, and this is an example that was calculated at say 40 gigahertz, you can see that you're going to have these uh, nulls and RF power detectors as you go along. This is shown more easily in this type of curve here. This is showing the fiber distance versus the carrier frequency. And you've got two sets of curves. One is single mode fiber and one is dispersion shifted fiber. This shows you the power penalty, whether it's one to three dB RF power penalty at the end of your link. And you can see this is a log curve. So you can see how dramatic the fiber gets reduced as you go up in frequency of the signal that you're trying to transport over that optical fiber. If you're looking, for example, at a 30 gigahertz RF signal over optical fiber, you will be limited to a fiber distance of less than one kilometer if you could only support a degradation of one to three dB. And so people have looked at different ways to combat this uh, dispersion effect. Um, very similar concepts to looking at doing it in the digital domain, using Greg, uh, fiber Bragg ratings, for example, to compensate for that. But you can also do some clever things by modifying the optical spectrum. You could get rid of one of the sidebands, which is something that we did uh, some time ago and showed successfully that we could do this. If you get rid of one of the sidebands, then you don't have this um, uh, another sideband to to um, potentially uh, reduce that power, or you could re or you could get rid of the optical carrier itself. Again, only having one mixing term and Im uh, improving that. The other issue with RF over fiber links is that they have a limited signal to noise ratio performance uh, and also linearity as well. And so there's been a lot of research done on achieving high spurious free um, dynamic range uh, numbers over very large operational bandwidths. And there are different ways that you can do this. You can try to improve this before you put the signal over the optical fiber. You could do it in the optical domain itself or you could do it at the, after your um, photo detector itself. And all of these have had various levels of, um, of success, but there are ways to do it. But it becomes more challenging as you go up higher in frequency. The other thing that you could do is to, uh, as I said, do it uh, looking after you actually detect the signal. And this is something that we tried where we actually transported the signal at RF to the an end of the optical link. Then we did some frequency down conversion, still in the optical domain. And then we used, uh, once we digitized that signal, we actually used some uh, digital signal processing to in fact do the performance improvement and in improve the dynamic range. And so this is something that you can also do as well. Use DSP techniques after the optical end of the optical link as well. And this is sort of similar to what's being done in the in the digital communication world. So when you look at how you can actually uh, successfully transport a millimeter wave or even a sub terahertz signal over optical fiber, um, there are some challenges here. One of them is how do you actually get such a high frequency signal onto an optical carrier? At this point in time, those types of devices can't do that directly. So you have to come up with other ways to actually get the RF signal into the optical domain. And something uh, that we did a few years ago, we worked with um, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory to do this. And here we were looking at potentially a 6G system, looking at very high frequency millimeter waves and also sub terahertz as well. And something that was developed at APL was a way to generate this frequency uh, in the optical domain that you could actually tune over frequency range from 30 up to 100 uh, gigahertz. It was also very low, low phase noise as well. 
And the way that this was done is to use a fiber ring resonator and to use a, sti a stimulated Bruan scattering within that fiber um, ring resonator. So when you pump this particular cavity, if you pump it in such a right way that the, the wavelength matches in that resonator, you can actually get SBS gain occurring. And in fact, you can do some tuning to generate these frequencies that are very clean. When you look at the optical spectrum, you can see that here is your pump laser and here are the, all the different frequencies within the cavity that are being generated. And so you can see that this separation here of this predominant frequency gives you a very, very high frequency up into the millimeter wave or sub terahertz frequency region. And so once you actually generate the, the, this optical spectrum that can give you this RF signal, then you also need to modulate that as well with the data in the wireless network. And the way that we did this was to actually separate uh, one of these wavelengths and to put the data that we were trying to transmit directly on that. And so we did some experiments where we demonstrated an RF over fiber link at 60 gigahertz using this type of signal, uh, very high frequency signal generation technique, putting the modulation directly onto just one of the wavelengths. So we separated the two that come out of that particular uh, SPS laser, just modulated one of the wavelengths, and then we used some very um, high frequency photo detector in order to receive that signal, we amplified it. And you can see that we did this experiment both indoors and also outdoors. And in order to achieve any reasonable propagation distance in free space, you really need to have a lot of amplification because of the fact that the signal gets propagated so quickly through free space. But you also need to use antennas that have very high gain as well. And you can see that the devices that we were using was up had a, a gains of in excess of um, 40 dB for the gains. So this type of approach has also been done in uh, terahertz frequency range too. This is work that's been done at NTT. And here, what they, the way that they were able to achieve putting a such a high frequency onto their optical carrier was that they use an optical modulator at a lower frequency to actually generate multiple tones. And then they used an optical filter. This case, it was an arrayed waveguide grading to separate the particular tones at 100 that was spaced 120 gigahertz apart in a similar way to that we were using that concept. So then when you um, put those two frequencies over optical fiber, then you can put the actual data uh, onto using a conventional max sender modulator in their case, they were using gigabits per second of, of data. And then at the other end, they did direct detection of that very high frequency. And they used a particular type of photodiode that's been pioneered by NTT called an ultra um, traveling carrier wave photo detector, which actually has bandwidths in excess of, of that kind of frequency range. And then they did the, their air free space transmission at such a high frequency. And they, again, they used a very simple uh, receiver at the other end um, and to get their data out. They did this both indoors and they also able to do this successfully outdoors as well. So again, very high data rates through free space and using reasonable amounts of, of fiber distance, 400 meters, and also air transmission paths as well. And so in addition to that, looking at, the, again, the sub terahertz frequency range, this, again, this is an analog RF over fiber system. This was also done at NTT. So they also try to improve the performance of their radio link to get even higher um, data rate in excess of 40 gigabits per second. Here, what they did is actually did something similar that, um, to what I showed before, We are also using uh, digital signal processing after you receive that signal in order to really improve your signal to noise ratio and allow you to get um, even higher data um, data rates to the user. So this is just some examples of the technologies that can be used in the optical domain for future uh, 5G plus or 6G networks that uh, work in the millimeter wave sub terahertz frequency range. And so I just wanted to summarize showing that 
I think there's going to be some interesting opportunities for these future networks that work in very high frequency ranges that where analog RF over fiber links can play has some real advantages in terms of that sort of wave of the frequency transparency that they provide and not having to deal with the need to get very, very high digital data rates being supported going to the more conventional digitization approach. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for not just um, optical technologies, optical devices to be introduced, but also if we're going to go into the terahertz frequency range, then clearly electronic components um, uh, really need to be introduced and to need to be commercialized as well. So it'll be interesting to see how 6G evolves. Um, uh, right now, I think that perhaps being a little bit ambitious and even five years, potentially maybe 10 years might be um, something that can be introduced, but certainly they're well on their way to looking at, at some of those standards. So thank you very much. And um, I think we have maybe a few minutes for, for question time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalmanova. Thank you. Uh, we will take a short questions. Uh, we have got something in the question box. I can share it with you uh, so that you can have. A... <clears throat> the first question that comes, we are talking about 6G when 5G has not been widely spread. What are the advantages of 5G over 6G? Well, I think people would argue that 6G has advantages over 5G. I think 6G is all about, you know, people trying to um, expand the capabilities of 5G, in, you know, high, even higher data rates, um, reducing the latency, making the the reliability of 5G e even better. So I think, I think it's about extending the, the capabilities. And I think this is, you know, when you look at the way, you know, it could, we can be a little bit cynical and in terms of thinking, well, 6G is, is a way off. And I think it is. But I think it gives people an opportunity to think way ahead and to start perhaps that thinking process about next generation technologies. But, you know, it is very true that 5G still has not been completely deployed around the world. I think it's still a, a work in, in progress and still needs to, to continue to be a work in progress before we get 6G introduced. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question that is, uh, what is the benefit for using 3.5 gigahertz over 5G applications? Well, I think it's really just about the availability of components. So three and a half G, you know, if you also look at the, um, um, the components are more readily available, but also three and a half G, you can more easily implement um, not just your electronics, but your beam forming that you need to have as well. So it's more about uh, availability and also compatibility, particularly when you look at these systems that were um, being built on legacy 4G networks as well. Uh, one more question. Uh, kindly explain advantages of sub 6 GH gigahertz and millimeter wave. So um, I, I sort of a follow on to that last question. So the thing about going to millimeter wave frequencies is basically the higher the frequency you go, the more data rate or the more data rate bandwidth available to you because it's always a percentage of your center uh, RF frequency. So the whole rationale to go to very high carrier frequencies is also to is always to allow you to go to um, higher and higher data rates. The challenge with going to millimeter wave frequencies is that the characteristics of your beam are different to lower frequencies. Going to higher frequencies, it tends to be a point to point link. So if you want to have millimeter wave frequencies in your phone that can support these very high data rates, in addition to these millimeter wave antennas, you need to have beam forming network associated with it so that you can point your antenna, which tends to be point to point in any direction according to where the user is and how their head is located. And so going to higher frequencies is all about just enabling you to go to high data rates, 
but it becomes more challenging in terms of the implementation of the technology. Uh, we can take one or two more. Can I use DWDM with ROF to increase data to terahertz, THZ? Yes, you can use dense WDM. So you can certainly use, um, uh, you know, depending on the spacing, your carrier spacing, whether it's 100 gigahertz, you can certainly use that to carry multiple wavelengths, each having the um, particular amount of data on it in the, you know, tens of gigabits per second. And then you can get that kind of um, terahertz link that you're looking for. Okay. Last one, we will take one short question. Uh, that's from Michael Long. ROF over 5G, will there be any issues with the localization of the mobile unit and handover between base stations? So in the current system or the next generation system? Uh, I'm sorry, could you read the question again? You, you want to? Uh, could you read the question again? I wasn't uh, sure. I, uh, ROF over 5G, will there be any issues with the localization of the mobile unit and handover between base stations? Well, I think that um, if we're going to be in the analog domain, that's certainly something that would need to be looked at in terms of how to interface with the um, with the digital network. So that would be something that would be a technology challenge to have to overcome. Okay. Uh, the last one, I think that will be over. Yes. Will 6G implementation reduce communication risk over hacking? Communication risk? Communication risks over hacking. Hacking. Oh, hacking. Well, I mean, hacking, certainly yes. as you, one of the, you know, the key issues with going to higher frequencies is that they're very secure, right? Because they're actually very, they're point to point. And so you don't, um, I mean, p potentially, yes, I, I would, I would say yes. I think the whole thing with 6G, particularly it builds on that ultra reliable low latency. Um, security is a very big part of that. And so it's applications that require very high um, security will definitely be leveraging that. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dalmanova. Thank you. Thank uh, you. We come to the end of the presentation session, but uh, I would just request uh, Professor Dr. Zia Ahmed, our vice chair, professional activities, to propose the vote of thanks. Dr. Zia, please. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Novak. Such an um, interesting talk, especially with all the technical issues. Yeah. Thank you for the discussion in fiber optics to phase shift in RF uh, as we go higher in the frequency. All these uh, issues you have really brought to our uh, attention. It's, it's really um, very uh, informative talk. And I think I will be going over your presentation a few times to really uh, understand all the issues they are facing um, in the development of technology from the com electronic components to uh, all the signal processing side. So I, it's really very, very interesting talk. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming um, back to R10 for the second time. We heard to your uh, very good presentation last time on diversity and inclusion. And today, a very technical talk so really, we are very thankful to you for giving your time to us. And yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here again at Region 10. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Yes. Uh, Novak, just, you said it's a, a, yeah, a home, just home we region. want to have a group photograph before you leave. I know you are in a hurry because you have some other engagement. After yes, this actually, that you I'm about to give already a mentioned in the workshop. <laughs> uh, so can we can we just have a, a group photograph and then we can close it? Yes, thank you. Renu, can you just have the group photograph, please? Nice. Jennifer, Jennifer, can you have your camera on, please? Video.
I think Lance was with us, still with us. No, uh, no, Professor Lance has just just now left, just now, not even a minute. I'm sorry, Sanjay, I can't start. Sorry, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Renuk, once you finish taking the photograph. Okay, thank okay, you. It's still time. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. So, Thelma. We come to the close of thank the you, session. Dr. And uh, just to, before we say goodbye, our next webinar will be on R10 panel on climate change. That's the next Saturday. Our panel of speakers, uh, Dr. Shea has confirmed, we are just looking for the next one. And just on the next day on 30th July, we have the R10 training on climate change. That's particularly for the students. So two programs coming up back to back the next weekend. And as usual, thank you, Dr. Dalma Novak for joining us. And uh, Thank you all the members of the Art and Talk team, particularly Renu, Hishan, and everyone else, Dr. Vimonta, whoever is there, whoever is working hard to make this Art and Talk successful. You can give us the feedback by scanning, scanning the QR code, or you can mail it to us also if you so require some questions to be forwarded, we can do it for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can close the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you everybody. See you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.